Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. I hope you've enjoyed my rant about biology really being systems biology. There's nothing beyond systems biology. All of biology is about systems in some way. That's exactly what, what sets it apart from mere physics or chemistry or biochemistry. So that's all good and fine, but if we think that biology should be systems biology, then we also need to have a better idea of what a system is. Everybody's going around these days saying they're doing systems biology. All the genomics people, you sequence a few genomes and you do systems biology. You do some transcriptomics, you have some network graphs somewhere. Um, everybody in their grant application is doing systems biology. This lecture is part of a master's in evolutionary systems biology. Um, there's molecular systems biology. I don't know how that works. And even the European Molecular Biology Organization and Institute have become focused on uh, systems biology, although molecular biology used to be exactly the opposite of systems biology. You would go in and study organisms at the, the molecular level. Um, so you would basically get rid of the organism like we've seen in the last lecture. So how can we make uh, biology look at organisms again? We have to think about systems. It requires a slightly different thinking. But before we can even talk about what that is, we need to, to um, think a little bit about what a system really is. So let's spend a few minutes defining a system and let's go to sort of some sort of random online dictionary, Merriam-Webster in this case, and look up a definition. The Merriam-Webster dictionary tells us that a system is a regularly interacting, interacting or independent group of items forming a unified whole. There's already something, in, something really interesting here. So a group of items, they are interdependent, they interact, so it's dynamic, and they form a unified whole. We have to think a lot about what that means. What, when is a system a whole and what is that? So this is very concise, very short, very precise, but not very useful. So let's expand it a little bit. This is from a paper by Hall and Fagan in 1956, channeling the views of uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, the Viennese uh, godfather of modern systems theory. And they say, a system is a set of objects together with the relationships between the objects and between their attributes. So there are relationships, there are objects. This definition uh, is sort of, it's a bit static for me, right? It's relational, it tries to relate different, different objects together, but um, it doesn't really do it yet for me. So let's go on and look and, and, and add to this definition. Here's Michael Savageau, a biochemist and modeler, who says a system can be defined as a collection of interacting parts. So here's the clockwork universe underneath again, which in some sense constitutes a whole. That's no longer the clockwork universe. What is that whole? Everything excluded from the collection is considered the environment of the system. Oh, oh, okay, so the definition of a system is very important, is setting a system apart from the rest of the universe. So there must be a boundary around the system. So if we want the truth and the full truth, of course, we need to go to Wikipedia and look at what it has to say about systems and here's the definition from the uh, current wikipedia article on the topic and it says a system is a group of interacting or interrelated entities that form a unified whole so far so good we've had this already a system is described by its spatial and temporal boundaries okay surrounded and influenced by its environment which is outside the boundaries it's described by its structure and purpose and expressed in its functioning. Okay, we need to take this apart a little bit. And then systems are the subjects of study of systems theory. Fair enough. So this is what we're gonna try and do. We're gonna uh, apply some sort of very philosophical systems theory here to biology in this lecture. So let's examine this a little more. So what are the entities that are interacting or interrelated here? We have to think really hard about that. 
So there's several questions involved here. So the entities that are interacting could be objects, they could be events, they could be agents, they could be processes. It's not clear what they are. So we need to think a little bit more about that. You may have a hunch what I prefer uh, in this context. Also, the other question is, uh, if we have a system, are the entities that interact specific examples of something? Or are they whole classes of things? We can define a system over more than just a specific instance. Okay, so are these entities, uh, in philosophy speak, we would say tokens or classes? Okay, um, that's a question that will keep us busy as well. Let's go on and say a system is described by its spatial and temporal boundaries. There's a really big question here and how do we define these boundaries, especially if you tend towards uh, being interested in systems that are made of processes. I told you already when we introduced process thinking that one of the major drawbacks of, of a process perspective is that it's really difficult to define the exact spatial temporal boundaries of a process. This will become a really big problem. And the biggest sort of mystery in here in this quote is how does the structure of a system relate to its function or purpose? So it is quite obvious what the structure is. Some sort of, we draw the components and their interactions and we get this famous network graph, okay? We have a representation of the structure of the system. It's also sometimes called the topology of a system. And so here's the network metaphor and that's very useful. And that's also very straightforward to describe. You, you uh, have to just know, and we'll give you an example uh, uh, of this in a second, um, what the components are that you're interested in and how they interact. Okay, but how do you get from there to the function of a system? What is the function of a system? We'll ask that question um, again later on. And then the purpose. So his, this function is always somehow linked to a purpose of the system. It, the system is for something. And that, of course, is a very controversial notion in biology, uh, which we have to discuss in detail. So let's expand. Let's move uh, on from these very simple definitions of systems to uh, a bit more realistic, dynamic, and also uh, complex definition, which comes from an absolutely wonderful book uh, uh, Richard Lewontin and Levin's uh, Biology Under the Influence, a collection of, of absolutely uh, uh, fantastic essays. And one of those essays is called Educating the Intuition to Cope with Complexity. I highly recommend you read that. And the major statement it makes is that very Wimsatian sort of view of the world. Uh, Wimsat, by the way, was Lewontin's student. Um, and in this essay, uh, they argued, the authors, Levins and uh, Lewontin, argued that uh, complexity is measured by the number of different valid perspectives, basically, that you can have on, this, on a system. They don't quite put it in those words. But they also give a very interesting definition of what a system is. Let me quote that. A system is a network of variables. Okay, this is interesting. So variables imply that the entities that are involved in a system, they can change over time. But variables are also something that we use in mathematics. It's a formal concept to describe something real, a phenomenon that's happening. So we'll have to think about what is the, the, the correlation between a sort of a formal system and an actual system out there in the world, if you want. So these variables are linked by positive and negative feedbacks. I like that, we haven't had that before. So if the whole is to be unified, what does that mean? And here we're starting to think about that. When does it make um, sense to, to talk about a whole at the system level? Okay, many systems are just aggregates of, of parts. These parts interact and their collective behavior is just additive. You can add up their individual contributions and you get an aggregate. For example, um, the atoms that contribute to the rock, you know, they form granite all together. They all have the same contribution and you can just add them up and you get in the end from the molecules, you get a rock. There's no mystery there. There's no, is there a hole? Is there a rock? Okay. This is, these are questions we have to discuss. 
But in systems where you have lots of positive and negative feedback loops, this becomes very different and it becomes very different, difficult to um, predict the, the behavior of the system at uh, its systems level from the behavior of the component parts. And in addition to this sort of feedback, these variables are usually not in equilibrium, but in continual movement within limits and around an equilibrium state. So they're sort of influenced by what we will later in this lecture called, call attractors uh, of, of a dynamical system. But they're not quite at the attractor, which is a state of steady, is a steady state. It's a sort of a form of dynamic equilibrium. So they're far from that, okay? And they're constantly in flux. Further, each part has its own dynamics. So here is uh, Simon's near decomposability again, or modularity of, of systems how it responds to outside impacts. So there, there's a, a sensory sort of function. Systems perceive input from outside and erases those impacts each at its own rate. So in a way, they also imply there's a very rich quote here. They, they imply that the behavior of the system depends on its history. And each module of the system has a different sort of memory of that history. Um, so this is sort of, a bridge into this uh, uh, sort of classic um, definition of a complex adaptive system that goes back uh, to work at the Santa Fe Institute uh, by uh, John Holland and, and Murray Gell Mann and others uh, at the time. Um, and they come, came up with a sort of a formal definition of, of what a complex adaptive system is that's very widely used right now. And here's a sort of a cartoon version of uh, uh, complex system. Uh, I've chosen a, a mouse, a rodent, and its prey here. Um, and you can see that there are, uh, there's some sort of, uh, on this side of the, the, the graph, there's some sort of input, there's sensory input. Um, the system is perceiving its environment. There's some food, some energy that goes into the system. Um, the system has a very complicated structure components that are interacting just like we had in these, in, in these very simple definitions of systems. And um, they constitute uh, uh, the mouse here, which as a whole, as a unified whole, constrains the behavior of its parts. We'll come back, that's very important. So there's, there's not only a sort of a causal flow up from the components that constitute the whole system, but the behavior of the whole system, which has some coherence, influences and constra by constraining, for example, the behavior of its parts. So there's, there's a feedback, not just among components of the, the, the molecular sort of subsystems down here, or the cellular subsystems, but uh, there's a feedback between the systems level and the component level below it. And so you get from this very, complex so the, the energy flowing through this 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 complex um structured um rule-based um sort of system you get uh some sort of complex behavior like uh cheese eating and gathering here um we can uh very, you know list a few more characteristics and make this definition uh, definition of a complex adaptive system a bit more precise so a complex adaptive system, there's a very important distinction. You can have a complicated system or you can have a complex system. A complex system shows systems level behavior that's not easy to predict from its components. A complicated system is just that, a lot of different interactions, it's a big mess, but it doesn't necessarily um, show this independent system level behavior. It can be a pure complicated aggregate of interactions. So here we have a large number of components and they have to interact in nonlinear way, ways because linear systems are always predictable and aggregated. Um, the structure of the system, this is how I've drawn this network, has to be multi-level, it's hierarchic, hierarchical, a mouse is, is made out of uh, uh, tissues which are made out of cells, organs, tissues, cells. Uh, the cells are made out of biochemical macromolecules, genes, proteins, uh, and so on and so forth, which are made out of molecules and atoms, of course. Okay, so we have a multi-level structure uh, and that structure is near decomposable. I've also used a network that has a modular structure 
um, with hubs. So there are certain nodes, like the central one in the network I've drawn here, that are connected to a lot of other hubs, uh, other nodes in the network. Okay, so what you get is called a small world topology, which means that if you want to get from one node to the other, if you have such central hubs in the network, you can get very quickly from any one node to any other node. This is called small world structure, small world topology. And also the sort of number of connections that a node has in a network, which is called its degree distribution, the degree distribution of the network. So different nodes have different uh, um, numbers of, of connections. Uh, and this distribution in the case of complex adaptive systems typically follows what is called a parallel, which is uh, a distribution with a very fat tail. Uh, Nassim Taleb loves to talk about fat tails. Fat tails are statistical events or statistical elements like nodes in the network that are exceptional but very important. Like these hubs in the network are very rare. In the one I've drawn here, there's only one central hub of all the nodes, but they have a disproportionately big influence on the network and also the evolution of the system. So these are, these are sort of technical term, terms that I would like you to remember. They're going to be very important in the future. Also very importantly, uh, any complex adaptive system is far from thermodynamic equilibrium and it's open. That means it's open to flows of matter and energy. If you don't eat, you die. If a plant doesn't get any sunlight, it dies. And this is an essential sort of uh, aspect of living. We'll come back to that. And also, the system has to be structurally coupled with the environment. It perceives its environment, but it also um, influences it, its environment in unexpected ways. We'll come back to that later. Um, and so in this sense, there's a lot of positive and negative feedback, not only between components of uh, uh, the molecular or the subnetwork level, but uh, also between the system as a whole and uh, the level of its components. They influence each other reciprocally. So this is where reductionism obviously fails because it assumes that all the behavior can be reconstructed from decomposing the systems, uh, the system into its component parts. Okay, so dynamics are history or path dependent. So uh, the system, complex adaptive systems need memory, otherwise they cannot adapt. Um, and complex global behavior emerges from local interactions, but the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Otherwise it's just an aggregate. And I've said this before. Lastly, and, and maybe the most important feature of, of complex adaptive systems is they're, they're not just resilient or robust against perturbations, they're anti-fragile. That means that they're adaptive. That's the very definition of it, adaptivity. They learn from errors uh, in an evolutionary sense. They learn, a population learns from some of its individuals dying, but also complex uh, organisms themselves have adaptive behavior. They can adapt their behavior within a lifetime to their environmental conditions. And uh, on an evolutionary scale, that leads to some of the components being generatively entrenched. We've talked about this before. So when components become very important so that if you would remove them, too much of the system would crumble with them, they cannot be removed anymore. And they become an essential part of that system, while others that are more at the periphery and don't uh, have so many dependencies can change. And this will greatly influence the evolutionary dynamics of the system. Just to remind you as well, so I talked about organisms here, right? And we're gonna continue talking about organisms. But as I said in my lecture about uh, Bill Wimsatt's perspectivism, you can apply this abstract formal definition of a, of a complex adaptive system to science itself and its institutions and its communities. Um, instead of food and, and um, perception, you get smart people, energy and funding going into the system. The people that are in the system constitute the system, but it constrains our career choices, our research questions. And so you get, in the end, a complex scientific theories out of this uh, very complex adaptive systems behavior. And in the end, you get a scientific worldview that is able to adapt uh, just like an organism is uh, adapting to its environment, our scientific theories are adapting uh, to our current environment and the problems we are encountering in that environment. 
So let me give you, let me sort of come back from this sort of complex systems level to, to give you a very, very simple example of how, um, what it means to define a system and what the difficulties are that are involved. So let's introduce for the first time in this lecture, my favorite animal, which is not a fruit fly. Fruit flies are tephrodid flies that are parasites on fruit. This is a vinegar fly. It's called uh, Drosophila melanogaster. And uh, it doesn't eat fruit. Here it's standing on a banana leaf, but it's actually eating uh, microorganisms that grow on decaying fruit. So it's not an agricultural pest at all. It has lovely red eyes, uh, a segmented body plan, which you can see here very clearly in the abdomen, but also by the arrangement uh, of its legs. And for a, for a big, uh, large time of my career, I've uh, spent trying to model and study the gene regulatory networks that lead to the formation of this beautiful segmented body plan. And there are a bunch of genes that are involved in that process, which are called the gap genes. So we're gonna look at those. And what I'm showing you here is a Drosophila embryo. This ball is one huge cell, about uh, between a third and a half a millimeter long, so visible by the naked eye, just one cell with many, many, many nuclei. Every dot you can see here in this picture is a single nucleus, but these nuclei are not uh, separated by um, cell membranes yet. There's just a one cell membrane around the whole thing. And uh, here's the future head end on the left and the future tail end is on the right. And this embryo has been um, peeled, the technical term is decorionated and then uh, colored for two different gene products. So what you see here is the distribution of two proteins that are encoded by gap genes. They are transcription factor that reg factors that regulate other uh, genes expression. And they are present in only a subset of the nuclei in the embryo. You can see in blue is a gap gene called giant. And in green is a protein made by a gap gene called cruple. And so these two genes, uh, they regulate each other. They are transcription factors. So what we want to find out is how do they regulate each other and how do they generate the pattern that we see in this embryo? This is what we want to know. And so we want to define a system, which in this case is easy. We can just say, okay, here we want to know how these genes interact. So let's just take them and their interactions and uh, let that be the system. So here um, we're trying to go from those genes <clears throat> and the proteins they make, they go through uh, the embryo and they bind to the other gene. The genes are represented by these boxes. The arrows indicate where uh, the, the DNA sequence becomes transcribed. And these transcription factors, they bind um, uh, to each other. And for example, the, the, the green transcription factor goes and binds here in front of the, the blue gene. And so now the question is, how do these two genes interact to create the pattern that we see in the embryo? And the striking feature of this embryo, of course, is that none of the nuclei express both of them at the same time. So basically what you have here is a very strong mutual inhibition of these two factors, which I represent by these two T bars that make up this mini tiny gene network here. So you have two genes, they interact each other, uh, with each other like this. Of course, there are other factors, for example, those factors that have to activate them in the first place. They're not considered here yet. And if you put that simple system um, <clears throat> this negative, uh, double negative uh, feedback loop, which is a positive feedback loop, and twice negative, positive, right? You, you inhibit an inhibitor, that's an activation. So that forms a positive feedback loop that locks the cells uh, that carry this network either in the green state or the blue state. But now we can ask ourselves, what have we done here? Okay, we can ask ourselves a whole series of questions. How did we define the system? Why did we choose those two genes or gene products? I didn't tell you. I gave this example because it's visually appealing and it's very simple. Okay, but there, why would you draw a boundary there? I can tell you that there are other gap genes that also regulate these genes. So it was completely arbitrary in a way. But for my purpose at this point, it was exactly what I wanted. I only wanted to talk about these two genes because I wanted to have an example that's very simple. So for my purpose, this way of defining the system was completely okay.
But then if you're, if you're actually more serious about studying this pattern forming process, you have to think about why do we focus on transcriptional regulation only? There are many other biochemical regulatory processes going on. Um, the RNAs of these genes are spliced. Um, there is trans, uh, post-transcriptional and post-translational regulation, even those proteins are modified um, with different phosphorylation, et cetera, and their activity uh, is 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 uh, affected in this way. So I have to justify at some point why did I focus on only one step in this entirely uh, obscure and very complicated um, uh, biochemical cascade? I focus on genetic interactions only. I can tell you that the, the molecular details of these proteins binding to the other genes uh, DNA sequence are very very complicated but I've just ignored all of them and said, okay, so there's just a net positive or negative, in this case, negative interaction, repressive interaction between the two genes. What allows me to choose this level of abstraction I, and idealize away all the details, uh, the molecular details of this process? Why did I only choose a specific spatial domain? I didn't even tell you that, but I only chose the middle of the embryo because here you see there's a much more complicated pattern of giant in the head, uh, the future head of the uh, animal. And, and I cannot explain this pattern at all with the two factors that I have. So I've deliberately chosen to focus on only a specific time in space, at a space, a, a region in space, and also a specific time during development. Um, when these two genes interact. These are all questions, all of them, that depend on my purpose. What am I trying to do? What is my goal here? My goal was just to give you a very simple example of a pattern forming process and how you could study that um, using a systems approach. Um, but when you do research, you have to wonder, what are all the uh, important interactions and factors? What am I interested in? At what level do I want an explanation? And all of these choices not only depend on your system, it, they also depend on what you want to get out of the system. That's very important. That's the essence of perspectivism. And so um, some people like uh, uh, Dominic Chu have argued that because of all of those choices being dependent on our questions, there is no such thing as a system. So Dominique is uh, pointing out in, a, in this wonderful paper, um, which is called Against Systems. Um, I'll refer to it um, in, in uh, uh, and provide this paper as reading material. So, so he makes two points. One of them is how we draw the boundaries around the system is, is arbitrary in two ways. First of all, which factors you include, like you see here, you could draw um, the boundary very wide or then uh, focus in on a subset of the system that explains all that you're interested in. Or you can choose certain subsets of interactions um, from uh, all the, the, the totality of interactions that you have in a system. And how you do this will completely depend on what you're interested in and whether those interactions or factors actually contribute to the phenomenon that you're interested in. So Dominic takes this very far. Here he is, uh, and he is saying, he's asking the question, is there a system an sich, sort of in the world out there? And his question is, no, okay? There is no such thing as a system out there. System definition, he writes, is a choice that mostly depends on the specific purposes that motivated the modeling exercise. Okay, so we, we may say, oh, if, if systems are the main objects of study in biology and they don't even exist, what is happening here, okay? So uh, complexity, again, just like with Lewinton and Levins and Wimsat, is seen as the difficulty of making choices about which elements of a system to include in a model. The more complex the system, the more difficult it is to get your perspective right, because the more choices you have to make, which is a direct, um, consequence of complex systems having many perspectives that are valid. Okay, so uh, the, the father of uh, cybernetics, Ross Ashby, uh, agrees with Dominique. A system is a set of variables selected by an observer. It's up to you. It's in the eye of the beholder, basically. So what are we going to do? Fuck the system? No. 
I want to argue, and I'm going to end this lecture on that, that systems are real. And I give you a wonderful uh, series of quotes from uh, Austrian systems biologist, Paul Weiss, um, which wrap up, which are a bit complicated, so we'll have to parse them, but they, they pretty much wrap up what a real world system is. Weiss says here, pragmatically defined, a system is a rather circumscribed complex of relatively bounded phenomena. So you, you can recognize it, sort of. It's not easy, but you can see that it, it is something. We, which within those bounds retains a relatively stationary pattern of structure in space or of sequential configuration in time. So th there is, again, there's, there's a recognizable behavior in nature and you want to understand that behavior and you can bound it to some degree. But this happens in spite of a high degree of variability in the details of distribution and interrelations among its constituent units of lower order. So the components come and go, the interactions come and go, but that pattern, that overall pattern that you see remains the same. Behavior at the system level, not necessarily one-to-one -one dependent on behavior at the level of the parts. Second quote, the systems concept is the embodiment of the experience that there are pattern processes, I love this quote, which owe their typical configuration, not to a prearranged stereotype mosaic of single track components of performances, not like a machine, you don't have predefined components, but on the contrary to the fact that the component activities have many degrees of freedom that submit to the ordering restraints exerted upon them by the integral activity of the whole in its pattern systems dynamics. So the behavior of the whole is not only not predictable from its components, it affects the behavior of the components downwards. Uh, we'll come back to that when we talk about causation in complex systems. The basic characteristic of a system is its essential invariance beyond the much more variant flux and fluctuations of its con uh, constituents. Again, it is defined at the systems level, not necessarily at the level of the components. This is exactly the opposite of a machine, yes, in which the structure of the product depends crucially on strictly predefined operations of the parts. In the system, the structure of the whole determines the operation of the parts. In the machine, the operation of the parts determines the outcome. This is why organisms and systems, complex systems in general, do not behave like a classic mechanical machine. Okay, to wrap up, what I wanted to tell you in this lecture is that systems are real. They're not just in our heads, they are uh, robustly observable pattern processes. And th this fits, of course, perfectly into the definition of reality, of trustworthiness, um, of robustness by uh, Bill Wimsat. But complex adaptive systems allow for a large number of valid independent perspectives. So there's not only one way to look at them, and we should use a lot of different perspectives to go at them. And when formalized in some way, those perspectives become models of the system. So a formalized perspective of a system on a system is a model of the system. And we can uh, use those models to study what the system is capable of doing. We'll go into this in the next lecture. I hope you'll join me again. Uh, thanks for listening.